Okay, so while people are still taking their seats, I'll just get us started here. Um, my name is Caitlin Billingham. I'm one of the conference directors, so thank you all for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to just introduce you to both our panelists, but um, I'm going to introduce you to our panel moderator who's sitting up here in red, Becky Davis. She's an assistant professor at the College of Nursing, and she's going to be helping us run through, um, just guide us through just the discussion and conversation we're going to have here for our current topics in Global Health Panel. So without further ado, Becky Davis. Wow, you need applause for the moderator. <laughs> well, good morning. I'm really happy to see you all, and I'm really happy to be here with the panelists. And I think that we all have um, great bio sketches of you in our program. But what I'm wondering before we start the questions is maybe you would just introduce yourselves a little further, just a, you know, just a few words. So my name is Sarah Basti, and I am a pediatrician who went to medical school here at Creighton. Um, and since graduating residency in New York, I work in Malawi with Partners in Health and just got back from six months in Mozambique um, working with Health Alliance International. And I'm completing, um, at the moment, my Master's of Public Health and a Global Health Fellowship. So um, you know, my husband and I have worked um, in the global health field for the last several years together. And although I'm kind of young, so hopefully I can still add to this conversation. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Steve Luby. Um, I graduated from Creighton as an undergraduate um, quite a long time ago. Um, and have been spending the last 25 years um, working full-time in global health, including living for five years in Pakistan and eight years in Bangladesh. And uh, I'm very glad to be back uh, at Creighton for a little while, talking about some of um, what, uh, talking about these important issues. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Katari, um, internal med doc. I took a circuitous route to medicine, had first trained as an economist and working as a development economist in the field with the monitoring evaluation research organization called Power Reaction Lab for two years. Uh, then went into medicine. I now split my time, half time in Boston, uh, and then half time in Nepal. And and in sort of looking for this type of job, which has been awesome for the first five years or so, it was it was not as overwhelming as I thought. So for a lot of folks who are intimidated by following a non-traditional career, I'll be very happy to talk to you about some of how I found this found the opportunities as a development economist and also as a, as a clinician. Well, we have until about 11.55, I'm told. And I have some prepared questions for our panelists, but we will stop sort of around the area of 11.40 so that you may ask some questions as well. So if you are starting to think of those, jot them down and we'll get to that. So for our first question today, we wanted to ask, you know, resources limited in settings and it presents significant barriers to healthcare delivery. Whether these limitations are related to personnel, to infrastructure, or to supplies, or if they're imposed by regulations or other physical constraints, each represents a unique challenge. So can you please comment on your experience in these kinds of settings and the steps that can be taken to deliver care in the face of these barriers. Shall I start with ladies first? Sure, we go in the pass it down. All right, so um, a few of my ideas, what I would say is if you're working in a uh, low resource area, would be number one, creativity, and then also aim for low hanging fruit. So creativity, as you work abroad, you will, pick up these little tricks from other colleagues of yours. Um, but you will not always have the lab test you need, you will not always have the imaging that you need, you will not always have the medicines that you need, so you need to be able to adapt. And so um, it's not always ideal, but you sort of do the best that you can um, with what you have. So for instance, um, you know, I trained in New York City and we would treat diabetes, uh, <laughs> DKA, um, for kids. Um, with, you know, you'd have drips of insulin and you would be checking labs every four hours and gases every hour and, and modifying the liquid, uh, you know, the, the drips that you're giving them. Well, I had a kid that, I, that walked into the, the pediatric ward in Malawi that I thought had DKA and there's none of that. I mean, you cannot even get like more than two lab tests done in, in an entire day. So 
um, you know, we sort of had to do a lot of guesswork, and we would, you know, we could test her urine glucose, we could do a finger stick of her glucose, and then we had to just do sub-Q insulin, right? We couldn't do drips of insulin, and you try to resuscitate with fluids, and so I think that there's ways that um, you can kind of, it's not ideal, and you can um, come up with creative solutions. Also, if, you know, you're doing an LP on someone, and you don't have a lab to run the, the specimen, you can, it's not ideal again, but you can use, you know, urine dipsticks to look for um, glucose to look for proteins, look for different things. Um, for pediatrics in particular, low low weight babies, um, you know, in America we keep them in incubators. We have to keep their temperatures tightly regulated. And a great thing that now we even, I mean, it's used in America now too, is kangaroo care. You just put the baby on the skin of the mother, right? And you can regulate the baby's temperature that way. Um, so. You, you can just use creativity for a lot of these things to get around them, but again, at the end of the day, like these are band-aids and we need to address the bigger issues, but um, as you work in those uh, in those environments, you do that. And then I would also say aim for low-hanging fruits. So um, sometimes it's not that you need something new and fancy and shiny. You just need to make the current system better. You need to make it function better. So if you can identify gaps, um, then you can help your resources go further um, and you can allow yourself to do, to do more work. I would really echo a lot of what Sarah says. Um, I think that, that um, working in severely constrained settings, you don't have what you were trained for. Um, one of the um, odd characteristics of clinical medical training is that it's very um, regimented, and you know this is what you're supposed to learn in the first year, this is what you learn in the second year. Basically, from the time you go to high school, um, each of the objectives for each year has been set. And yet when you go into a global health setting that is constrained by poverty, by ethnic differences, by linguistic barriers, by structured adjustment programs, by long history, all of a sudden you find yourself in a very disorienting setting. And in those settings, um, knowing how to um, interpret a blood gas actually may not be the critical skill. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand creativity, to, to, to understand these situations and try to approach them creatively. One of the things I'm often struck by, or was certainly struck by a lot when I first started, was that I thought we were having a conversation and what we were saying was the substance of the conversation. And it took me a while to realize that actually the content of the conversation was not the most important element of what was happening in that interaction. That there was an explicit conversation, if you will, on top of the table and something else going on underneath the table that typically had to do with power relationships um, and, and with what this meant for the face of people involved. So um, so I think that if you're going into these settings, you have to go in with an open mind. And I really encourage you to dig down to try to understand those constraints better. Because actually by beginning to understand and name them, then you begin to have a strategy by which you can work to contribute. So to echo what Sarah said, the good news is a lot of what works, especially if you're creative, and what works well is actually fairly cheap. Mm -hmm. um, just speaking, uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about, about the experience of my organization, both possible and Nepal. On top of operating in, in a setting with scarce resources, we also impose the additional constraint. We want to do things that are sustainable and that don't lo undermine local sort of institutions. So one thing, for example, is we actually constrain ourselves and say, you know, we, the care that we provide in our catchment area should fall under $50, $50 per person per year. That is roughly what uh, is spent on health care from all sources in Nepal. So, for example, we don't even try to figure out a way to provide dialysis. Because we know that even if we do, let's say if we have a great fundraising year uh, over in New York City, like no, no government will be able to scale up that model in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Bhutan, in India. So that's, we don't even try to do that. Um, and with the sort of fault, like living within those two constraints, we try to hire. So speaking, sort of speaking to sort of, uh, Sarah's presentation, ninety percent of our staff are Nepali, 
And on our sites, no non nephology is allowed to provide any clinical care. Uh, and the funny thing is, a lot of the challenges we face are challenges we face here. So, for example, no nephology, especially if you're trained in Kathmandu, a lot of them don't really want to work in a rural area where there aren't like bars to go to. <laughs> you don't have like 4G internet on your phone. Uh, like doctors get bored there. So that's a challenge that we face there that I think I sort of face here in the U.S. as well. Uh, from supplies, we face a challenge where we'd like to rely on the government supply chains. So the government in Nepal sort of guarantees that uh, for any of our hospital, and we're a government hospital, we just independently manage it, but it falls under the government purview, we offer uh, 74 free meds. However, the supply chain is not very strong, so that's a challenge. So how do you balance um, sort of trying to strengthen and utilize the government supply chain with trying to run a functioning hospital? So those are some of the more challenges. So then some of the meds that we don't get regularly, we have to try to find um, on the private market. Yeah, okay. Let him go first. I'm going to change it up on who gets to start first now. Okay, so just a little bit of a follow-up to our first question. We um, would like to ask you, in your work, were there any instances where the challenges you encountered went beyond what you would have initially expected? And if so, can you elaborate on one instance or more where this was the case? Or was there ever an instance when you, when something you perceived to be a small challenge actually ended up being a significant barrier to overcome? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. The first thing that comes to mind is, uh, so recently after the earthquake hit, we wanted to expand to, you can remember from Dr. Morrow's talk, a district in the eastern side, it was called Dolica. And, uh, uh, before we expand to any area, we want a contract from the government saying that, you know, it's okay with you guys. Um, it's going to be a public-private partnership. It'll still be your hospital and you're responsible for it. We'll manage it, but you have to regulate us. And you have to provide co-financing. And part of the co-financing early on, especially when it's infrastructure, will bring in a greater percentage. And it was very interesting for me to see, being in the fall, um, that even you know we our co-financing amounted for the initial portion was say about a million dollars, and it was a great lesson for me about sort of the political environment and working within that. The government was still very hesitant, and there were there were members that were probably willing to let the million dollars go rather than sign. And then it was very interesting for me to think about why, especially like me met in the govern the governance wing of the organization, and realizing that you know there was this Maoist revolution, and you have people that ideologically are very against having sort of private organizations, especially foreign organizations, sort of running such an essential part of your social service delivery component. And how do you talk to those government officials versus other uh, government officials who were hesitant for, there were some that probably seemed the way they talked to us wanted to bribe, and how do you sort of approach that? to uh, other sort of government officials with bad experiences with other hospitals that came in and then shut down in five years, and in those five years, you, you actually weakened the local hospital no one went there anymore. So how do you lay their fears? So that it was very surprising. In some levels, the organization got frustrated thinking, you know, we're giving, you know, we're bringing all this to the table, and yet you're not willing to say yes right away, and why? So I think, and that's a great learning experience for me. It's terrific to be asked this question um, following an economist. Um, <laughs> I think that um, when I was in medical school and I thought about um, what the problems were with global health, um, I thought the biggest problem, the biggest disparity, the biggest um, barrier we had to bridge was poverty, that there wasn't enough money. Um, and I was surprised by how many times the problem was not so much lack of funding as it was what the economists would say was incentive structure. So I realize that Sarah has talked about the importance of building up um, public institutions, but public institutions, hospitals in Pakistan and Bangladesh have been, have been evaluated by 
people at Drew's school and have really articulated the strong incentives that government actors have to keep the quality of care low in public hospitals. And the reason you want to keep quality of care low is if you come in and say, well, look, you really do need a chest x-ray, but I'm sorry, we don't have any radiation film, but you're in luck if you go to my clinic, which is located across the street, I actually have an x-ray machine and I have supply and I have procured some radiation, some film. Incidentally, that was what was given to the government, but um, so they've now shifted it over there. And you don't want to, and they don't want to make, um, if you make your public services too strong, then you're unable to extract money for your private services. The same thing happens in public education. You don't want the education quality to be too good because then people won't pay the teacher for tutoring off hours. So I think I was really struck by how this wasn't, that, that, that the incentives really worked against the public interest and that these incentives were a deeper problem than lack of money per se. Wow, so both of those were really great examples. I'm going to give a really concrete example, um, the clinical example of a time that things went beyond, you know, how hard I thought it was going to be to treat, and that was uh, malnutrition in children in Malawi. And the reason is because I don't know uh, everyone's knowledge of, you know, malnutrition and how it's treated, but there's sort of moderate or mild malnutrition, which you can treat as an outpatient with you know, sort of like these particular peanut butter type things, and then if kids are really, really malnourished, you have to put them in an inpatient ward and treat them with um, these high, highly fortified milks. Um, so it seems like, okay, great, you put a child in, you bulk them up with milk, you send them home, case closed, they're fixed, right? And so what we, in the very rural village where we lived, I kept seeing you know a couple of relapsers, children that would keep coming back. We would send them home with that peanut butter, but then you know a couple months later, they would come back. And there was like this cycle that you couldn't you couldn't break because, you know, to realize that you're sending that child back to the exact home with the same food insecurity and the same dirty drinking water that they're going to get chronic diarrhea from and then get malnourished once again. Um, and on top of this, at the time, um, Malawi was having a drought, and so all the people that we served were basically subsistence farmers, and so they, they rely on their crops in order just to feed their family. So the family has no crops, the family has no food to give their child, the child has dirty water, and so it was this this feeling of um, just feeling very powerless. Like I'm giving you the peanut butter, you know, why aren't you getting better? And it's just it goes so much beyond the scope of even what I could do um, that it it just felt sort of um, kind of overwhelming in a sense. So it really opened you up to the scale of these problems. Well, to continue with our questions. We wanted to ask what one health determinant would lead to a reduction in non-communicable disease if it were addressed, and why? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think if there's one thing we could do, it would be to reduce smoking levels, and the and the way to do that would be to tax um, cigarette companies, to tax multinational cigarette companies, um, because basically you're um, producing a product that's killing people. Um, there are there are shareholders that are making money on it. There are a lot of folks making money on it, um, and uh, it is the single largest preventable cause of um, of um, non-communicable diseases. When I hear people say, "Oh yeah, we got to figure out how to treat hypertension in low-income countries in rural areas," so I've got to tell people we need to measure your blood pressure tell you this is a silent disease that you don't have any symptoms of and then provide medication to you every day to take and monitor and say, wait a minute, this is not the approach to non-communicable disease. Let's do one thing right. Let's focus on our tobacco policy globally. And, and these companies have so much money that they're very um, able to work just like um, uh, they, they, they have their own lobbying wings. And so so, so there is a big push not to have taxes on tobacco products. And so, to me, this is a huge global health priority, and that would be the number one thing I would do. 
that's a great, uh, great answer. Just sort of thinking, of, when I think about population health, you know, I think you have strong public health institutions, strong sort of primary health care. Then you, you do need, when, for emergencies, good hospital-level care. This is the area I work. You need to be able to reach all those things. And the, the area that uh, hospitals are working in the longest is in the foothills and the mountains. You still have pretty high sort of, I mean, we call them small mountains, that people have to go up and down over to get to sort of any of these places. And it's just hard because the roads get washed out in the rainy season. They're all dirt roads. There's no paved roads. I think roads in, in certain areas, especially rural remote areas, uh, would make a big difference. And secondly, uh, sort of education levels and sort of being able to educate sort of anything from sort of uh, pregnant women to uh, new moms or warning signs that so that you can start that track to get to that clinic would be important. I think a lot of what I so when I think about in even non sort of cities in the US, you sort of have a system that opens up. So even people who aren't very educated, if you wait to the last minute, generally in the city we can get you to the hospital in five, ten minutes. And uh, often, the good news here is people are fairly educated, so they know some of these warning signs. But in areas we have neither, you really run into trouble. Well, you took my answer. I was going to say education. But um, I think that that's really important because then it allows people to be vigilant for signs and symptoms of their own diseases, and it empowers them to be advocates for themselves. Um, but education also goes with, you know, healthy lifestyle habits that, um, you know, things that we as healthcare professionals might think is very obvious. And I've talked a lot about my work, you know, abroad, but also I trained in the Bronx. And so very different population, but, you know, working in primary care there, you would see these children that were far, far, far above the 99th percentile for, for BMI. And the parents are like, oh, yeah, they have, you know, Dr. Pepper and Fritos for breakfast and this and that. And, like, you know, there was just kind of no constant, or teenagers that, you know, that were drinking like five or six 20 ounce um, of sodas every day. And they think, oh, but I'm not having like hamburgers, right? And you, you're like, you don't understand that in just the drinking alone that you consume like three times the amount of calories for the whole day. And so it's something that, um, you know, it's not even on their radar screen. And it's people, if we could, you know, educate now, we need to educate and also give people the tools to act upon that knowledge that they have for sure. But um, but I think definitely education will allow people to at least be more informed and make smarter decisions. Oh, you guys have some great answers. Okay. For the next question, whether it's in a rural village or a city center, many people do not receive the health care they need. Can you share a lesson you learned through your work that you feel is applicable regardless of the exact location. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to go first? I can go. Okay. <laughs> You're not tired of me yet. <laughs> um, so I have a couple, many things came to mind when I, when I heard of this question. Um, one is, yes, I can think of many people who did not get the care that they deserved. One is um, a little girl that I treated for almost the entire year I was there, and she died shortly before I left, and her name was Nolia, and she had, um, we think tuberculosis, but also um, a very large part that didn't pump very well. And so we were two hours away from the closest hospital, and there was one cardiologist there that, you know, from time to time we thought, you know, she needs she needs a scale up of care, right? She needs something that goes beyond what I can manage here. Because in America, this child would be on a list, probably get a heart transplant, would be on multiple medications in the meantime. And um, so she would go back and forth, but even every time she would come back, the heart failure would just get worse and worse. And, and one day, um, while we were seeing her in the, in the hospital, she actually um, died right in front of us. So that is one case where I just feel like, you know, this and then a couple other kids that I had that had chronic kidney disease, as you mentioned, the dialysis, um, you know, it's just like so frustrating because you feel like there is a concrete way to fix this, but in low resource settings, you can't offer dialysis in a rural village and you can't offer cardiac surgery in a rural village. And so there's people that if they were in America, they would probably be okay. And because of lack of specialists and lack of resources, you just know that they are, um, they're kind of needlessly dying. Um, and another example of this, you know, I'm pretty much in pediatrics, but I interface a little bit with maternity because of the babies, is all the women who needed C-sections. That we, now, the facility that we worked in in the last three years, they now have allowed, um, they have an operating room now so we can do that. But at the time that we were there, women um, that who needed C-sections would have to, the, the decision would have to be made by the midwife, and then whether or not we're going to use the resources, we had like one ambulance, and it's a three-hour drive to the other hospital, 
Are you going to go down the mountain road, and is she even going to make it there alive in time, right? Or is it something that the nurse here can troubleshoot? So there's all these decisions that you have to make as, like, is she sick enough? Can we handle it here? Is it worth the time and resources? What if all that ambulance is out, another person gets sick, and you need to send them to the hospital, right? So I think for me, I would, I think that a lot of these examples kind of come back to either surgical needs or specialist needs. Um, yeah, the U.S. spends um, more money per person than any other country in the world, um, and that's a, a greater proportion of our GDP and a greater amount per person, and yet we don't rank in the top 30, um, either in terms of infant mortality or life expectancy. So I think one thing we have to do is be very careful about saying when we go into low-income country settings, what we need to do is do what we do in the U.S. Um, in fact, I think that if we know a lot about the U.S. system and we're really familiar with the U.S. system, we're probably toxic to, um, to places because our patterns of thinking and our ways are so dysfunctional. Um, so I think it's really critical, yes, we get into severe um, difficulties in low-income country settings. There are constraints when we see people dying who, um, who are preventable either with better technology or better access or um, a less exploitative system. So what do we do as a global health worker? I would say more than anything else is um, global health is a team sport and you don't do it alone. And the critical issue for me has been long-term engagement in a couple of places with strong local partners. So that um, as these issues come up, we can talk about them, we can think about them, we can troubleshoot, and we can try to work towards solution. And often, uh, and, and I feel like I'm just a participant, rather than the typical clinical model where, oh, the physician is the decision maker, and right, the physician writes orders tells you what to do. Again, not a very good leadership model, not, not a very good management model um, in the situations that, that we walk into. But I think strong local partners can really help us. Maybe they're not going to be willing to say it in the meeting. Maybe it's going to take a while before they um, say, Steve, I actually think um, we might need to think a little bit more about some of the ideas that you had suggested. Okay, which, you know, that's code language for saying that was really crazy, uh, and so. Um, but but together we can we can we can work towards um, addressing some of these problems. Some of you an answer that I was going to never say ten months ago, but uh, sort of working uh, within this organization has really opened my eyes to the importance of a good in both rural and urban areas, the importance of like a good management structure and good work culture. So, for example, in my organization, everyone who's hired fits into the organizational tree. You need to have a manager. Every manager can have no more than five direct reports. And your work week has to be structured that you have to meet with your, your manager has to meet with each of their direct reports for 50 minutes every single week. Uh, you're, you're reviewed every three months, and your sort of job and pay are linked. And you can sort of see that a lot of, I think, what... Uh, uh, Dr. Luby mentioned when it's not really about money, it's about how that money is being used. Having the structure allows sort of possible to make sure that the supply chain is running well because someone is responsible for that and they meet with their manager and they meet with the people that help sort of make sure that the supply chain runs. And if it doesn't run, that person is responsible. Uh, someone is the medical director and they're in charge of uh, sort of meeting with each of the sort of mid-levels that run outpatient clinic to sort of troubleshoot every week. Uh, and in being in that type of organization, you have specific responsibilities and you feel heard and you feel important and you feel that your work, when it's ideally done, is uh, sort of promoting the goals of that organization. So I think that, that is very applicable both in rural and urban areas. Thank you for those reflections. I have a feeling you all might have some questions for our panelists. Um, so I guess I'll just put the mic here in the middle, and you can, I'll kind of point at you, and you can address whoever you'd like, okay? Um, well, I, I guess it's sort of a general question, and I'll maybe, if need to be, I can kind of make more specific, but 
I was wondering if you could speak to the ethical components of resource allocation in a, in a, in a city like a rural area. Um, when I was a student in Ghana, uh, I was fortunate to be at a, at a small hospital, and one of the things they were facing is they didn't have enough resources both for community outreach and acute care. Uh, what, so what they decided was they, they tried to maximize acute care so they could save the most lives. Um, but then they're denying access to, to other people and other people whose lives might be saved in another way. So uh, I was wondering if you could just speak to that ethical quandary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a philosophy major at um, Creighton and, and thought a lot about ethics and thought a lot about Kant's categorical imperative and the deontologists. Um, and you know, um, it's really painful um, when the rubber meets the road um, and having to make some of these decisions. Um, and I think that you have framed this correctly, that sometimes there are very painful trade-offs and trade-offs that um, we don't feel good about. And I, I think the only um, advice I would have would be to reflect very seriously on these decisions and understanding the consequences of the decisions um, and to make those with open eyes and then bear consequences. And I, I just lost a field worker in one of my field projects to a uh, road traffic um, crash last week. Um, that young man, uh, the eldest son um, uh, from his family, would be alive today if I had not gone in and stood up this project. And we also made some decisions on how we were going to transport field workers. Um, and so in some sense, it might be easier to stay in Omaha and, uh, and not engage. The reality is when we engage in these complex settings where resources are constrained, where motives are mixed, where there's corruption and difficulty, um, choices are really hard, and just as a physician, you make hard choices, and sometimes you get bad outcomes. The same thing happens um, overseas, and I, I, I think that we need space to think about that and and talk through it, um, and sort of absolutist guides about how to do it um, turns out not to uh, get to solution in highly complex settings. And even if you take a step back, I mean, just again, referring back to your wonderful presentation this morning, I mean, why are those difficult decisions having to be made? And sort of us being cognizant, even when we're not, even if we're in a phase of our life where we're training, or if I'm in a phase of my life where I'm working in the U.S. full time, maybe just keep in mind that, you know, people I vote for may vote sort of or different sort of World Bank or IMF chiefs, or may support different types of sort of agricultural policy that affects some of these countries that we have worked in in the past. Just be mindful of that. That's very comprehensive. <laughs> have any other questions? Um, well, I've not been abroad, um, but global health comes to me in my rural area. Um, where we have a lot of complex chronic disease management issues. And you've already spoken to you know, the, the issues very comprehensively. Thank you. But getting back to that first question of where the response was to education um, and growth. And uh, interestingly, um, the barriers that we have would be the willingness of someone to accept that education. Um, you have to process it. Also, health literacy is a huge problem. Um, cultural differences. Uh, you just don't believe in your Western medicine. Uh, and language barriers. So we don't have a lot of translators. Multiple languages translators. So education is the key. But how do we provide it? And then um, just speaking to roads, which is so fundamental. But rural, distance, um, money, and uh, we have roads, but people don't traverse them. <laughs> people, we have this um, 
culture where you know you'll come to me. I mean, that's very Western. You're you're going to find your own transportation, and if you can't get to me, I'm sorry. So uh, we're trying to focus the problem. We're trying to focus a lot on outreach, but then there's cost. So I don't know if this is a question, <laughs> but I do feel that um, you know, I'm wondering if you have any response. I forgot to jump on whenever you talk about roads. I have to like definitely get on board with that. That's a, that was a huge help for us in this whole three-hour drive to the hospital. If the road was paved, we could have gotten women there in probably like an hour, you know, and we could have gotten medications to us easier. We could have gotten so many like, better infrastructure into our village. Um, the roads are huge, and um, Jason and I are going to visit Liberia um, in a week or so. And where we're going is like they told us a 17 hour drive away from Monrovia. And if the road was paved, I think it would be like eight hours or something crazy like that. I mean, so the, the roads, if you have, we, most roads here are paved, so we don't really think about it, but a paved road is like a godsend. I mean, it really helps you out get, get, getting people and stuff around. Um, that's also a really good point you made about um, the, the mentality of, you know, we'll be in the hospitals and when you're sick, you'll come to us. Um, and I think that another way that my mind has been open to the, the alternative of, like you said, community outreach is um, like village health worker programs or community health worker programs where um, you kind of have this fleet of people um, and it can be like, you know, a hundred village health workers and they're all, you know, responsible for maybe like 20 different families and they do go and they check in on those families that screen for tuberculosis or HIV or malnourished children or pregnant women and then, you know, all of them come back and report. So there's sort of a way to like, have surveillance over communities and have your have your finger on the pulse of what's happening out there, so you know. Um, but I don't I don't think that we do that. There's a couple of models I think going on in Boston right now, right, for community health like that. But I don't think in general that that's a big part of our health system here. So that's a really important point that you bring up. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I think uh, yeah. I mean I guess you can. Sounds like in maybe. Just for the audience and for us, can you speak a little bit more about the area that you work in and the type of people you work with? It's a big island in Hawaii. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big island. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's a great question. Like, you build, it's more than just, yeah, you, you have to build the roads and then sort of bridge the gaps so that people can sort of trust you. And, right, and that, I mean, we face, I mean, those same struggles in uh, the area we work in Nepal, and some of it just takes time. So luckily, we've been there for eight, ten years, and now slowly people start uh, trusting you. And sometimes it just takes that time. And I sort of agree with Sarah very much. The community health, now that we're sort of really ramping up the community health worker team to the point where they can visit every household once every three months in our catchment area. Catchment area is still small, I think it's 53,000 that we'll try to visit. The good, I mean, it's easier there, I think it's hard, labor is very cheap, so I think we, we pay very high salaries, but still, full-time labor for community health workers is only $1,000 per year, so that's $80 per month, imagine what you can do with that, and it's harder to do, sort of, here, but in the general principle, I think, very much holds. Bangladesh is one of the few countries that met the Millennium Development Goals in terms of reducing by two-thirds its maternal mortality ratio. Um, and between um, 1990 and um, 2015. And one of the major ways they did it, um, so, so Shams al Arafin has done some analysis looking at this, um, and part of it was an increased access to cesarean sections, but two thirds of it was reducing the amount of travel time from um, rural villages into hospitals where they can get definitive care. Because if you want to reduce maternal mortality, you need to. Um, identify a high-risk mom and get her to definitive care, which, as you suggest, is often surgery. And in Bangladesh, it was actually cheaper to do that instead of trying to fix the whole healthcare system. Um, it's actually um, fixing the roads. But Bangladesh is, I mean, they have floods and there are some other issues around access, but probably a little um, easier place to connect. I can have one more. And it sounds like you an incredibly thoughtful practitioner and, and run a very thoughtful organization. But one thing that helped us, one thing that we do in Nepal, so it's in a given village area, our community health worker has to come from that area. And I think that helps. 
And even in Boston, where uh, where I work, I think just having sort of folks from that neighborhood, they're more likely to like relate to them, and you share lived experiences, and sort of feel like okay, you know, like you know, your advice may hold true because you know you've had similar experiences to what I had. Versus even if I go and say. Well, that's really to somebody who can say, Luby, this is not going to work here. Um, no, you can't randomize people. No, you can't do it this way. And that, that's really critical. And at the same time, to be able to come back and, and let me look at it. Um, people want to reject our approach. You know, I'm really surprised. We spend more money than anybody else, and we're um, not in the top 30. Maybe rejection's a pretty good idea. I, mean, I, 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 think, I think we should be a little bit careful about our biomedical religion, about what's the best way to, um, to invest in health. So I, I think a certain humility on, on our part is important as well. So you kind of talked about how the role as a physician in the U.S. is kind of incompatible with it in foreign countries. Or maybe not necessarily incompatible, but there's a big difference. So how did you find that transition from your medical training in the U.S. and working in a global health setting? I found the clinical training to be extremely useful um, because you do learn the biomedical paradigm in great depth, and that turns out to be a really powerful paradigm. The other thing, another thing you learn is you learn about what disease means. So because I work as a communicable disease epidemiologist, I also work with a lot of PhD trained epidemiologists. One of the very big differences about physician trained epidemiologists is if we talk about um, the impact of hepatitis C and end stage liver disease, we know what it, we have taken care of patients with end stage liver disease. We understand what that means in a way. When we look at when we see things we see it differently because of our experience taking care of patients third thing that really helps from clinical training is clinicians are trained to be decision makers clinicians are saying what am i going to do for this patient right now and you generated some data you have some training you can look in the literature but it's not a hundred percent clear it's not clear whether you should hospitalize or not. It's not clear whether you treat with drug A or drug B. You have some guidance from science, but you have to make a judgment. And sometimes you decide wrong. And if you're honest with yourself, you actually remember those people that you decided wrong on and had adverse consequences. Because of that, you refine as a decision maker. So I think those skills translate really well into going into a highly ambiguous 
situation where lives are at stake um, and where you have to chart a course and make decisions. So I think that some of the immediate bedside work was not as um, central in terms of my own path, but I think that um, the training was awesome in terms of his preparation. Mm -hmm. Add to that as well. Um, so I would totally agree that the, the medical training that we get here is, is extremely rigorous. I mean, you're working 80 hours a week, right? But um, I mean, that 80 hours, by the end of residency, you are sharp. Like, you know how to treat most things, and you have seen it all uh, because it's those late nights of working. So I totally agree that um, the rigor with which we're trained here, it allows you to understand the whole system so that when you walk in, you'll find that a lot of times the, the medical colleagues that you're working working with abroad on occasion, if they're you know, clinical officers, maybe they're not MDs, that they are trained um, to kind of process diseases of like algorithms, right? If it's a cough, it must be pneumonia, or if it's this, it must be that. And if it's kind of outside of that box, you can't really think outside the box very much, where the tools that you'll have going into that situation is that you'll be able to think like, ooh, okay, is this heart failure? Is this X, Y, Z? You know, is it a lot of different other things, not just pneumonia? So that's the one thing. I totally agree with you that the rigor of our education is, is helpful. Um, and as far as, like, how did you adapt? So I went straight to Malawi, graduated residency, boom, on a plane there, okay? Um, and so for me, I had never treated more than, like, three cases of HIV in my life, you know, or malaria or, you know, schistosomiasis or all these other crazy things that you treat. And so my advice would be observe. When you first get there, I would do rounds with my, my Malawian colleague, and because he knows a 100 times better than me how you treat not malaria, how you treat HIV. If a kid has this disease, what other things do you need to be concerned about? So just, you know, tandem yourself to your, your other colleagues and learn from them and just observe for a little while, right? So you can become better at that. I mean, I just second exactly what they both said. I mean, like, just, you know, always have um, just sort of the humbleness and, like, never become complacent. And, you know, in Nepal, like, Every sort of, because I mean, complaint will have a slightly different differential than in Omaha, and also probably Boston, maybe DC. And just observe initially, get a sense of what, what can that clinic and hospital do, and how should you be thinking about, you know, you know different, uh, uh, different sort of, the differentials for different complaints. But I agree, like, the way that we're trained here uh, is very rigorous, and the thinking that we do is very beneficial, and a lot of, so, um, sort of, I've been sort of when I'm on sort of rounds, sort of observing and teaching. I think that's one of the biggest things I can impart is sort of like you know how was I trained to do that sort of thinking, and they often fill in initially. They know the differentials better than I do. Um, well, I think we've come to the end of our time. I know you've probably had more questions, and I'll you can, uh, sure approach our speakers at some point in the day if you'd like to. Um, I just want to thank you very much for being part of our panel. Um, I, I, what I took away is that I have understanding how much you listen and how much you reflect in your practice. And also, I want to thank you for your leadership and for sharing with us. Thank you. Before everyone um, heads out, I just want to make a couple of general announcements about the schedule. Um, thank everyone so much for your patience um, and your participation for the first half of the day. Um, it's been extremely, extremely humbling to be a part of this process, um, both on the part of your audience participation and our wonderful speakers and panelists. Um, I'm sure everyone is hungry, though. Um, so right now, it's time for lunch, so you can make your way up. Um, stairs. Lunch will be on the fourth floor in the Harper Ballroom where the research symposium was held um, yesterday evening. Um, I also want to remind you that concurrent with the lunch time, it's um, an hour and a half long period. We also have a community fair happening on the third floor and a, a lot of local organizations will be there for you to chat and network with um, so you can split your time how you feel between community fair and lunch. And then we'll be blessed with Dr. Luby's keynote speech uh, following lunch. So. Uh, we'll be back to the normal time schedule, everything following lunch. <laughs> um, and let me know if anybody has any questions or concerns. And thanks. Thanks, everyone, for being here.